We had two terrific panels this morning. I'm sure this afternoon will be equally interesting. And uh, we start off with a more detailed inquiry into the one we began when we asked for remarks by Judge Owada and Professor Kingsbury. I noticed that on our first this panel this afternoon, a theme that seems to unite our speakers is they all have more than a whiff of real experience uh, with the topic. And of course, Paul Reichler was the lawyer who initiated the Philippines arbitration against China in 2013. I think I've told him, not knowing him at that point, January 2013, that when I read his initial document submitted to the UNCLOS Arbitration Tribunal, I thought legal documents can occasionally be a work of art because this was one of the most beautiful legal pieces I'd ever read. It was so adroitly shaped in order to fit within the jurisdictional limits of the tribunal. And it was so well written that I thought this could be a model for any of us trying to deal with adjudication, arbitration, etc. And Paul has been a very generous collaborator uh, with various exercises we have held. Peter Dutton, as many of you know, and I have taught a seminar together for the last few years, and it's been a great experience for me. He's much better at getting students to talk than I am, and he's a very articulate, dynamic, knowledgeable expert. Jonathan Odom, I haven't seen in recent years. I was thrilled when he could accept coming here to join us. He has spent years in actual dealings with China and the rest of Asia from his uh, military naval experience based in Hawaii. And I'm thrilled to see him back in action after he and I share something we both had a similar medical crisis years ago and we were among the living. Tim Gillat is not, unfortunately. <clears throat> Henry Bensurto has been the guiding light for the Philippines with respect to settling its disputes with uh, China involving the South China Sea. For many years, he's been the Consul General for the Philippines uh, in San Francisco, and I was very happy to see that despite the change in administration in the Philippines, uh, he's still able to take part in our discussions. So we've got a terrific group. I won't delay any further beginning, only to say that I regarded the arbitration brought by the Philippines as the most important challenge to the People's Republic of China concerning international law. In my lifetime, I held my breath for the 30 days that uh, the PRC had to make up its mind whether or not to join the arbitration. And like many experts from within China who are not able to voice their views, uh, I was, of course, profoundly disappointed. And the struggle is still on to see what is the meaning of that arbitration. But we'll know more after we hear from our experts. So Paul, uh, would you take over? And we're really delighted that you're here. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is really uh, a special occasion for me because I, I get to salute two of my heroes, uh, two absolute giants in the field of uh, public international law. Um, I have long been a great admirer of both of them. And at least with regard to one of them, this is the first chance that I can appropriately say so. Uh, and of course, I'm referring to Professor Cohen and to Judge Awada. Uh, Jerry knows what I think of him. Um, I've had the occasion to tell him uh, before. But I have had the honor, the distinct honor, of appearing before Judge Awada, I don't know how many times. He probably thinks it's too many, uh, tired of <coughs> hearing from me. But many, many, many cases. And I had to resist the urge, fortunately I did, uh, uh, in the middle of my presentation to just say uh, how much, how deeply I respect and admire you as a judge, as a diplomat, as a human being. And uh, it was never appropriate for me to do this, um, even in meetings that I would have with Judge Awada, uh, during, because they were all during the pendency of the case. And you know, it just doesn't sound good to go up to a judge who's about to decide your case and say, I just think you're terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as sincere as you might be, the judge might have some doubt about that. So now we have no cases pending. Uh, you're not wearing the black robe. And uh, I, I just want to say what a distinct honor and privilege it is to know you. And I'm blessed to have had the opportunity to appear before you. Um, the topic uh, of this panel, and uh, I, I will uh, follow my instructions, in what circumstances a tribunal successfully employed for dispute resolution in maritime cases? When, when, I, when I am uh, invited uh, to conferences like this, it's usually as a litigator, tell us something about how these cases are actually litigated. Um, and, and, uh, but this is a, uh, this is a, a higher-minded topic. Uh, and it, it causes me to think bigger thoughts uh, and it, it, it pretend, uh, although I'm not, pretend that I'm a scholar and uh, uh, try to uh, interpret um, events um, and, and, to, and to give some, some observations and conclusions. So I, I hope I can live up to Jerry's expectations. What I have done um, is I've prepared a list. This is not a complete list. There are one or two cases missing. I listed, for example, Malaysia, Singapore once. It should actually be listed twice, once under the ICJ. But it, it's a pretty complete list of all of the maritime disputes over the last 15 years that uh, have been resolved either by the ICJ, by ITLOS, or by, by Annex 7 tribunals and uh, one uh, conciliation panel under the Law of the Sea Convention. And I think it's interesting when, when we're talking about uh, in what circumstances are cases, uh, these types of cases successfully resolved, resolved to have an idea, to know exactly what, what cases we're talking about. So I've listed 20 cases. We can <coughs> add another one or two, but let, let's work with 20. Uh, 15 of these have been resolved successfully if we define successfully as uh, the, they've been complied, there's been an, an, an order or an award or a judgment and the parties have complied with it. Two of them are still pending um, and only three um, have resulted in to total or partial non-compliance so far. So before I get to those, um, what we can say is that respondent states, even though they're unhappy about being sued, have, for the, in the vast majority of cases, have accepted their obligations under the instruments that brought them within the jurisdiction of an international tribunal. They have participated fully in the case, and they've accepted the outcome. And uh, 
uh, in uh, most of these cases, not all of them, um, one of the parties was not uh, entirely pleased with the outcome, but nevertheless accepted it. Um, and what's interesting is that 12 of these cases, 12 of the 15 cases that I'm calling successfully resolved, uh, occurred because of the compulsory jurisdiction of either the ICJ uh, or, uh, or the Annex 7 <coughs> Tribunal. And I think that's a remarkable record. Um, the, it might also be of interest to look at what the geographic uh, distribution of the respondent states has been in these compulsory cases. Six, six uh, uh, of them have been from Latin America. Uh, the reason that Latin America is so disproportionately represented is because Nicaragua has been in three or four of those. But uh, uh, in two cases uh, involving Asian states, two involving African states, two involving either uh, Western Europe or Australia. So um, uh, what we can see is there's a, there's a, there's a very good uh, geographic distribution uh, in compliance. Uh, I, I, I took this a step further because this is a conference on Asia and East Asia in particular. And uh, if we go a little bit beyond the limits of maritime cases, that is uh, maritime boundaries, maritime entitlements, or sovereignty over islands, um, the following members of ASEAN have participated in binding third-party dispute resolution with another state. Philippines, of course, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Myanmar, Timor-Leste, Thailand, and Cambodia. So that's eight states. That's a considerable majority of the ASEAN states have participated in binding third-party dispute resolution of disputes with other states. And in East Asia, of course, we have Japan. Um, so that's nine, um, uh, not even Asian states, because we have, we have uh, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, et cetera, but, and Qatar, Bahrain. But in terms of Southeast and East Asia, that's quite a large uh, population of states that have accepted at least once, in some cases more than once, uh, submission of disputes, interstate disputes to binding third party adjudication. And I, I, uh, <coughs> I think Judge Awada, I, it was reported to me because unfortunately I couldn't come here until uh, this morning's train from Washington and um, I missed a large part of the presentation, but I understand Judge Awada said that we should not uh, assume that there is uh, a special reluctance to engage in third party dispute resolution <coughs> in Asia or in East Asia. And I think the numbers uh, uh, underscore uh, the uh, accuracy of what Jawa Judge Awada has said. Now, if we look uh, to, to try to see, look, look at the outliers, where, where has dis this dispute resolution of maritime cases not been successful? Um, there, are, there are three cases. One is the Nicaragua the first Nicaragua-Colombia case, where Colombia participated in the case even after the court overruled its jurisdictional objections. Um, and then, um, uh, in the face of a 17 to nothing uh, judgment, unanimous judgment, 17 judges of the court, including Colombia's own ad hoc judge, Colombia uh, rejected the judgment insofar as it uh, resolved the maritime uh, disputes, the maritime boundary disputes. Um, I, I still feel that, this was six years ago now, I still feel that uh, at some point Colombia will come into compliance. But uh, at the time, and I, if anybody wants to ask me about that later, if you're interested, I'll be happy to answer, but I don't want to go uh, uh, get too far off the central theme here right now. But, I, but I, at the time, of course, Colombia was, in, it was uh, approaching the climax of a prolonged civil war. And the president of Colombia was trying to hold together a coalition to negotiate a peace agreement with the FARC. Uh, 
and uh, uh, needed the support of nationalist elements who were most outraged by Colombia's perceived losses in the maritime aspects of that dispute. Um, Judge Iwata made an interesting comment about national honor uh, being an obstacle to submission or acceptance of binding third party dispute resolution. This, this might be an example of that. The other two cases involve Russia and China. Um, in the Arctic Sunrise case, um, uh, that was both before ITLOS and also before an Annex 7 tribunal, uh, Russia uh, at, at least formally refused to accept the authority of either. But the order of, the, uh, of ITLOS to uh, release the seized vessel, the Greenpeace vessel and the crew, was ultimately uh, um, complied with by, by Russia. Um, of course, they, they claimed that they did it for political reasons, not because of the order of, of ITLOS. But nevertheless, there is at least some uh, uh, element of, of compliance there. Um, in, the, um, in the case of China, in the South China Sea case, of course, we have um, what at least on the surface appears to be uh, an open defiance of uh, an arbitral award of the binding international judgment uh, in, a, in a maritime case. So I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think what we can, what we can some <coughs> conclusions that we can draw is that a large majority of states with a wide geographic distribution exhibit a special disregard for UNCLOS in particular and respect for law of the sea in general and are willing to accept international adjudication or arbitration <coughs> of maritime disputes with neighboring states, even though they don't want it, even though it's been forced upon them. When a dispute resolution provision of a treaty that they respect and consider fundamental, like UNCLOS, subjects them to compulsory jurisdiction. And even powerful states, like Russia and China, great powers, if you will, refrain from denouncing UNCLOS or from overtly rejecting the fundamental rules and principles of the law of the sea even as they are reluctant to accept binding uh, third-party dispute settlement under UNCLOS. I should mention uh, uh, the United States avoids being placed in the same situation by choosing to remain outside UNCLOS. Now, while there are numerous reasons for this, it's possible that one of those reasons is the refusal to accept UNCLOS's provisions for third-party settlement. And this raises another very important question. Is there a role for interna international arbitration or adjudication for maritime disputes involving the most powerful states? Now, uh, as international lawyers, including academics, practitioners like myself, government officials, I think we have an obligation not to give up on this, but to continue to find ways to extend and strengthen the rules-based international order, even in, in these particularly challenging times. And this means finding ways to make third-party settlement less objectionable to the most powerful states, or at least to make rejection of it more costly to them in terms of damage to reputation, loss of influence in the international community. And I think the more that states, the more states that participate uh, willingly, even if um, uh, reluctantly, in uh, binding third party dispute resolution proceedings, whether it's before the ICJ, ITLOS, or arbitral tribunals, the more 
the, the rules-based system, the more the system of international adjudication of disputes is strengthened, and the more pressure there is on uh, other states, including those that are among the most powerful, not to be outliers, not to consider themselves, or at least allow themselves to be depicted as over or above the law. A, a few observations on, on China in particular, and it, its non-compliance. Um, and, and this is based on my experience in the, in the case. Uh, first, although China has denounced the arbitral award in the South China Sea case, it has, in fact, complied with an important part of it. It has stopped preventing Philippine nationals from fishing at Scarborough Shoal. Now, this might not appear to the international community to be much of a concession, but it was one of the main reasons, perhaps even the last straw, that brought the Philippines to consider arbitration. And uh, at least as of today, uh, China uh, has uh, continued uh, since the arbitral award to uh, respect the rights of Philippine fishermen to fish in Scarborough Shoal. China has also proposed to the Philippines that the resources, hydrocarbon resources at Reed Bank, which is about 100 miles northwest of Palawan, be exploited by means of a joint venture. Now, some Philippine experts might point out, as I'm sure my friend Henry Bensurto will, that Reed Bank is located entirely in the Philippines EEZ. It's part of their continental shelf. And uh, China has no rights there <coughs> under the arbitral award. But if we're looking for hopeful signs, we can at least point out that China has not taken the position that since Reed Bank is located within its infamous nine-dash line, it is exclusively Chinese and, uh, and has uh, uh, kept the Philippines out of uh, the area. Instead, it has invited the Philippines to, to participate in a joint venture with it. I think that these, these and other actions show that China has been very cautious uh, even though it's been outspoken in denouncing the award uh, and in uh, verbally defying it, it's been very cautious in asserting or enforcing its claims within the nine-dash line, not only against the Philippines, but also against Vietnam and Indonesia, which vehemently and sometimes actively, as in the case of the Indonesian Navy, uh, reject China's uh, claims and incursions within, its, within their 200-mile zone. Another interesting fact is that although China has strengthened its, strengthened its hold on the seven or eight maritime features in the Spratlys that it occupied at the time the arbitration was <coughs> commenced, and it has gone so far as to build advanced military facilities on some of them, it has refrained thus far from forcibly <coughs> attempting to occupy any of the other dozens of features including those long occupied by Vietnam and the Philippines. And while the arbitral tribunal ruled that China's occupation of Mischief Reef was unlawful because it's a low tide elevation within 200 miles of the Philippines, the tribunal did not address, because it was beyond its jurisdiction, the lawfulness of China's occupation of the other features where it has sent military forces. So as to its presence at those features, China has not been found to be acting unlawfully, and its position is not currently threatened in any legal proceedings. And finally, China has been expressing interest in bringing to fruition the long-stalled negotiations on a code of conduct for the South China Sea. This might be lip service, but if it's real, there could be serious multilateral negotiations aimed at resolving some of the most critical issues. Where, where this leads me is here. Notwithstanding its bitter rejection and denunciation of the arbitral award,
China's actual conduct has been cautious thus far. Except for its continued occupation of Mischief Reef, it has been careful, for the most part, not to violate, at least not too flagrantly, the rights of the Philippines under the award, or the rights that other states, like Vietnam and Indonesia, claim under the same legal principles and interpretations that underlie the award. <clears throat> In other words, the door to settlement, whether via a series of bilateral understandings or a multilateral agreement, based on mutual expect <coughs> for each other's rights under UNCLOS, as defined in the arbitral award is not closed. In my opinion, at least, that door remains open. Nor should a settlement be viewed as impossible to achieve. Of course, it depends on the political will of the parties involved, including China. But what's important to underscore in this context is that the significance of the award has to do almost entirely in its essence, with access to resources. The tribunal did not address the most contested and difficult claims regarding sovereignty over islands, issues of national honor, if you will. What it did was to declare unlawful China's exaggerated and unlawful claims to exclusive access to all of the resources within the nine dash line. Instead, it upheld the rights of China and all of the other states that border the South China Sea to their 200 mile exclusive economic zones and continental shelves under, uh, under UNCLOS. What resources are we talking about well, there are two, under two kinds under uh, under UNCLOS: the the living resources, that is the fish, and the non-living resources, essentially hydrocarbons. Resources, unlike title to islands, can be shared; they're divisible. And one would think there has to be a way for the coastal states in the region, including, of course, China to negotiate an agreement on fishing, one that allows for the sustainable levels of all fish species, and to set catch limits for each of the relevant parties that both assure sustainability and adequate nutrition for the various peoples of the region, not just abundance for one, and starvation for the rest. Similarly, hydrocarbons and the revenues derived therefrom can also be shared. China has a pivotal, in fact, indispensable role to play in supplying through CNOOC the needed financial and technical resources that some of its neighbors lack, resources that are essential for the exploitation of any oil and gas under the seabed. <coughs> and so the essential parameters for sharing of resources through joint venture agreements that allow for the exploitation under the rights of the coastal states within their 200 mile zones, but with Chinese participation and a sharing of the rewards uh, is within the grasp of uh, enlightened negotiators uh, throughout the region. So it, it seems to me that these critical issues can be resolved by negotiations using the principles of law and the clarification of rights that were set out in the arbitral award. And such a settlement would be, of course, beneficial to China as well as all of the other states. <clears throat>
But what if the parties cannot agree? Well, this brings me back to third party settlement. Arbitration could be tried again, this time by Vietnam or Indonesia, because China has remained a party to UNCLOS and it's still subject to its provisions on dispute settlement. <coughs> but this is certainly now more likely to antagonize China and make a settlement less likely. So what's left? Well, what's left, I suggest, is the example um, brought into reality by Timor-Leste in Australia. Conciliation under UNCLOS. It's a, it's a, it's a case uh, study that deserves to be studied um, where um, it was uh, impossible for Timor-Leste to take uh, um, Australia to arbitration under UNCLOS because of uh, Australia's reservation of rights in respect to boundary delimitation but Timor-Leste invoked the compulsory conciliation provisions. Um, Australia participated, as was its obligation, and the five conciliators worked closely with the parties and ultimately, ultimately produced a resolution that was satisfactory and accepted by both parties. This is, this is certainly uh, worth considering. Uh, for the South China Sea in the event the parties are unable to come to a, an acceptable agreement on the sharing of resources. Let me make one more comment, or at least a, a raise a final question. Um, and, and particularly in light of the fact that the next panel will address um, uh, an equally difficult issue in the, in the East China Sea, and that is the islands uh, disputed by Japan and China, and raising the question, is there a role for third party settlement there? Um, I would suggest that third party settlement is, is worth considering uh, based on these two aspects. First, that the parties agree to set the issue of sovereignty aside. That is, of course, the most difficult issue to resolve. It's one that affects national honor, public opinion is most uh, ardent about it, and it's not divisible. Well, I suppose if there are several islands you could distribute them one to the other, but I, I don't think anybody <coughs> would take that proposal very seriously. Um, but if the issue of sovereignty is set aside, and as I've suggested in the South China Sea, the focus is on resource allocation, because after all, it does not appear that any of the, whether they're Senkaku or Daoyu Islands, it doesn't appear that any of them has any intrinsic value. I may be wrong, and the experts on the next panel may uh, demonstrate that. But uh, apart from national pride or national honor, the, the, what these islands generate are maritime zones, whether 12 miles or, or 200 miles, and the importance that attaches to them is access to resources. But uh, as I mentioned in the context of the South China Sea, resources, whether fish or hydrocarbons, are capable of division, of sharing. And uh, I think it was Professor Kingsbury who said uh, during the last panel that uh, these don't tend to be issues that arouse the greatest passions because when you're talking about maritime rights or resources, it's distributing something that uh, somebody hasn't had before. You're not taking anything away. So one way to look at, uh, at uh, how third party dispute resolution might play a role in the East China Sea is separating out the sovereignty issues from the issue of resource allocation and then using the Timor-Leste and uh, Australia model uh, as a way to resolve that sharing issue if it can't be done bilaterally by conciliation uh, and not uh, through a binding procedure, which almost certainly uh, China 
reject. Well, those are some thoughts, um, and uh, I hope they've been interesting to you, and uh, at the appropriate time, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Peter Dutton, who will introduce a new project that we've undertaken with the cooperation of some of the other experts uh, you'll be hearing from. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Alexis. Um, I think it's probably a, a perfect segue into a discussion about the project that the U.S. Asia Law Institute is undertaking over the course of the coming year. Uh, the, the examples and the, and, the, and the real pithy ideas that Paul mm -hmm. has, uh, has offered us um, are, I think, a perfect uh, way for beginning to frame the issues, the things that it is that we're attempting to look at. Um, the question really is, under what circumstances can international uh, arbitration or litigation or mediation, et cetera, in international institutional approaches to dispute resolution be successful in, in resolving maritime, space, uh, maritime disputes? And as Paul said, one of the best ways of thinking about that is, is where, when is it actually final, where both sides actually respect the, the outcome of the case. And so and it's really instructive to look at circumstances in which, uh, in which parties were not, uh, did not actually accept the final result. In some ways, perhaps even more instructive than when, uh, when parties did uh, accept the outcomes. That said, um, what we've designed is, um, is, a, is a project that we'll be working on all year. And it's got 10 different cases. Uh, 10 different uh, lawyers are involved in assessing each of those cases. Um, so, so we'll have 10 case studies. Uh, and what we'll do is we have a, we have a group of, of lawyers that are actually uh, who have agreed to begin to serve as a sort of a, a steering committee, a group of senior lawyers who can help us to figure out some of the, 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 the real analytical components of understanding the common threads. When was it successful? When was it not successful? Based on these uh, 10 cases, we'll have an initial report uh, by the end of the academic year. And I, and, and I look forward, frankly, to making this a longer project because really 10 case studies with a, a sort of a series of common questions to respond to is really just the beginning of the way that this question um, can, can be analyzed. It's important, though, of course, because, because um, what we're really focusing on is East Asia. And, and in particular, many of the topics that we've already discussed today about some of the unique ways in which East Asia uh, approaches international law issues. Sometimes uh, they're myths, sometimes they're not, but the degree to which um, East Asian, is there in fact an East Asian uh, approach that we need to take into account? Of course, in the East and the South China Sea, these questions are highly contentious. We know that they're highly contentious and, and therefore some of the most dangerous, potentially dangerous areas of the world for, for real conflict to result. I mean, it's not small states off in a corner of the world uh, where conflict is bad enough. These are strong states in, a, in an essential component of the world, economically, politically, and otherwise. Um, where, where instability can have very serious consequences. And so it's our aim to begin to uh, shed some light on, on what we can do to help minimize the potential for that conflict. And I have assigned myself a case, uh, and it's, I, I, I'm lucky I got to assign the cases. And so I got to assign a case that I had never read before, um, one that I, kn I knew I needed to understand better. Um, and so I assigned myself um, this little corner of the world here, actually. Um, not Again, not, it, 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 you might think this is a little out of the way, tucked away corner of the world, but in fact, this is one of the key waterways on the planet. This is the Red Sea, right? And so this is the, one of the major um, maritime uh, uh, sea lanes between, well, frankly, between uh, Europe and Asia, but, but <clears throat> one of the major global east-west sea lanes uh, through, through this area. So it's, this is the dispute between Eritrea, 
and Yemen over the islands that you see, and, and don't ask me to pronounce them all uh, because I, my Arabic is worse than my Chinese, so I, so I, I, can't, I can't pronounce them all. But the island groups uh, in, in sort of the, the funnel there uh, where, where, where the uh, Red Sea begins to empty out into the uh, Gulf of Aden. This is, a, this is an area where it was, uh, where it was quite contentious. And um, so, so, you're, you, so you're familiar with the geography. A picture is better than, than my description of it. But if you think of the Red Sea, as dumping out into the uh, Gulf of Aden on its southeastern uh, edge uh, to, to the northwest uh, is Egypt and the Suez Canal, right, and the entry into and the entry into the Mediterranean. So this is a, an important waterway, the the, the Red Sea, um, and the history of these particular islands is 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 fascinating. I'm, not going to delve into the history, don't worry, but, but I do want to point out that it, it has um, sort of pre-modern components to it. Uh, prior to the Ottoman Empire's period of, of control of that region, um, there was in fact a sort of regional uh, governance system that one of the parties, Yemen in particular, tried to sort of bring into the process. Then of course there was the Ottoman Empire, which for centuries ruled that, that area in various ways and in various degrees. Um, at the end of the Ottoman Empire then, which, which uh, came to a, a, a close at the end of World War I, there was a period of about six or eight years of treaty negotiations that uh, sort of finalized the, 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 the uh, uh, dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, immediately in the 1920s, that began about a 20-year period of colonization of that area. Um, uh, Libya and uh, Egypt and, uh, and uh, uh, what is now Eritrea, uh, Yemen, these were all areas that, that were colonized during the, the uh, or, or otherwise uh, ruled from outside uh, by um, by other countries during the, the interwar period between World War I and World War II. So again, there's, there's multiple parties and multiple moving parts as to who might control some the, these islands during this period. Then, of course, after the colonial period, uh, when, when uh, initially uh, Eritrea was part of the state of Ethiopia, and uh, Yemen had its independence, but it was divided by civil war into two different countries. Uh, ultimately, Ethiopia and Eritrea fought a civil war, and uh, finally, we, we end up uh, in, in the 1990s, really, not until the 1990s, when these two countries were stable enough to begin to uh, interact with each other and to try to allocate those islands amongst themselves. And what resulted was a short but sharp conflict between the two of them, right? So, so uh, this is an area with a very complex history, uh, periods of time when neither country was able to pursue its interests on its own, uh, periods when civil war interrupted the capacity of the states to, to, uh, to address their issues. Are, are any of these issues sounding familiar to Chinese circumstances or other uh, circumstances in East Asia? Right? So there's a lot of resonance here, lots of deep historical connections, not just to the islands themselves, but to the resources around them. Again, sounding familiar? I think there's a lot of things where we have commonality in, in this case to some of the significant issues in East Asia. I'm not going to give you a whole case report, that's not my job, but what I am going to do is, is to give you uh, four thoughts about some of the issues in this case that I found most interesting to, uh, to begin to think about what it is that might make maritime dispute resolution successful. Uh, and surprisingly, often in cases, it's the, it's the legal issues and the relationship between the illegal issues and the facts that are the most interesting. And, and I will tell you, uh, much to my own surprise, I found the most interesting aspect of this case to be the procedure. It's the procedure in which I think you can find some of the most interesting observations about how to, how to begin to get parties off of uh, no and out of conflict and into, into all right, fine, we, we'll, we will submit this issue to, to litigation. So um, the first uh, observation that I had um, was that the procedures were incremental. Um, there was a real effort over time to um, not only to incrementally bring the parties out of conflict and into an institutionalized process, this arbitration, uh, but even within that process, there were increments of, uh, uh, of essentially, I think, trust building processes. And a substantial amount of control in each of those incremental steps was left to the parties. It was a significant um, a significant process by which, uh, first of all, the arbitration decision itself was separated into two, two separate parts, two components. 
One first was issues about sovereignty, and then the second, once those were resolved, uh, they could begin to uh, make, make uh, decisions about, about boundary dispute resolutions. But beyond that, even leading up to the process of, of the arbitration itself, there were various, um, what I would call, uh, uh, um, uh, trust building processes, smaller trust building processes that got them to the agreement to arbitrate in the first place. Right? So it's essentially a negotiated, uh, 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 facilitated process so that getting to the point where arbitration can even begin. So that's getting to, uh, getting to yes, I, I would say, is the, is the first thing. Um, incremental, giving the parties a lot of control along the way, and frankly, even the opportunity to back out if necessary. Right? So the second uh, point is, I would say, um, getting to yes, um, was a facilitated process, as I mentioned. And so uh, I, the second issue that I noticed is uh, that it was all facilitated by the good offices of, of France. Um, you think about France. So uh, France was not one of the colonial powers in that region, that particular region. France is a permanent member of the UN Security Council and is a very active uh, uh, country internationally, uh, supporting, uh, supportive of international uh, law and international arbitration. Um, but an, an active player in the region in various periods of time, uh, uh, but not one in, that had been a colonizer. So it was very interesting, I thought, um, that France was the one who was able to bring the parties from um, conflict and to help to resolve the conflict and bring them to the point where they could, in fact, negotiate um, a series of arrangements to, uh, to, to work through the facilitation of the arbitration itself. So good offices, I thought, of a trusted third party who could uh, facilitate that transition from rejection um, to acceptance, I thought was, was here. Uh, very good. Um, the, third was the, the third interesting component here, and I need to learn more about it myself, is, is that there was, in fact, a, a period before this where both sides had tried force. Right? Um, there, there had been a small uh, conflict in advance of this, and it had left, essentially, it had left a stalemate. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating that as a step in this process. Um, but, but I am saying that it is one of those circumstances where sometimes countries recognize that they're just, they're, there are power-based dis dispute resolution processes, and there are institutional dispute resolution, resolution processes. And, and I hate to say it, but in the international system, sometimes countries have to recognize that power-based options are not going to work, right? And that ultimately can push them into, uh, into institutional processes. And in this particular case, I actually think that was an important component of it. The two countries essentially went into conflict immediately after they had resolved their own um, uh, uh, civil wars, and so they had powerful militaries that were perfectly, well, frankly, looking for a job to do. And so it was, it was one of those moments in time when, when conflict was tried and failed, and that, that did facilitate um, uh, moving into an institutional process. <clears throat> Finally, um, I think I will touch briefly on some of the outcomes. And in this, is, in this particular case, this was a case in which uh, historic fishing rights was in, in fact recognized as a, as a component of international law. Real transition, I think, in, uh, in, this, in bringing in the concept of historic rights and into modern international law and giving it some uh, standing and, 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 and uh, an important uh, way to help bridge uh, between two cultures. Because, because what we have here is very similar to the South China Sea. This is a place where uh, where there really was no strong sense of Westphalian, uh, a Westphalian uh, sovereignty uh, prior to, to the conflict. There was no period of time in which any particular party controlled these islands alone. Um, what was recognized was that there was a fluid sense of international attachment, cultural attachment to the islands themselves. Again, sound familiar. Right? It sounds very much like the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. So I think what was very, the outcome was a very thoughtful, respectful, and creative um, outcome that respected the particular culture and the cultural approaches that had historically been taken uh, in, in that area. And so I, th I thought that was a terrific thing that I, I would mention. Thanks very much. Now we'll hear from Jonathan Odom. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. It's 82 degrees where I live. Oh. Um, 
and I'm supposed to engage in Thanksgiving travel tomorrow to get back to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> why would I do that? Um, for these four individuals, the chance to speak with all four of them and, and, and just appear with them, uh, I have utmost respect for them. In, in each and every, I could go, to, it's not the role, it's not a roast, it's not a, a, an event where I'm supposed to speak about all four, but I just have a high level of respect for each of these gentlemen individually. Um, and so the chance to be associated with them is just awesome. Um, but in particular, I want to thank Jerry for inviting me. Uh, as Jerry alluded to, um, Jerry and I have a special bond. And uh, when he told the story about Tim this morning and how Tim uh, passed from a, a brain aneurysm, that was me six years ago. And I was in the hospital. And while in the hospital, I received a message from Jerry saying, yeah, I had one of those when I'm 59. I'm glad you're doing well. Good luck. <laughs> um, and and so, uh, so I'll always share that with you, a special kind of bond on that. But I particularly want to thank Jerry for involve, uh, inviting Paul to speak on the panel. Uh, so that during the question and answer, I will get absolutely no questions. <laughs> so, so because I um, and part of this project that Peter's is uh, honchoing about uh, these case studies and the case that I've been asked to look at is the case of Croatia and Slovenia, uh, which raise your hand if you have any familiarity with the case between Croatia and Slovenia. <laughs> Excellent. So whatever I say is ground truth. This is, I, I love this. Um, so no, the um, uh, you know, one of the things Peter does to work here at NYU part-time is that he takes the train from Boston often. And he uh, rode, one time when he was going from Boston here, uh, he sat beside David McCullough, the historian. And he, he texts me while he's on the train <laughs> that he's sitting beside David McCullough. And I think this is awesome because I love the Civil War series um, and his voice is so soothing. But one of the, uh, the only book I admittedly read, read by David McCullough was the one on Truman. And a quote that from that book was, uh, Truman said, the purpose of history is to remind us that the world didn't begin the day we were born. <laughs> and so I've asked myself, why is it someone working in the Asia Pacific region comes to North America to speak about a case that happened in Europe? And part of it is to remind us that it's, it is truly an international rules-based order. And so the things that we talk about in, whether it be Eritrea and Yemen, whether it be somewhere in uh, East Asia or somewhere in Europe, which is what I've been asked to look at, hopefully that's what it means. It is that it's one international rules-based order. Uh, and so as I've started looking closer at the, the, uh, the case, um, and I'll give you a little background quickly in a sec, but one thing I did notice is I was starting, it was the first time I read the case, I was forced to read it. Um, and as they list all of the participants at the very beginning, like they do in every one of those, I see Paul's name at the beginning. I'm like, well, we should just have Paul brief this case. Um, so, but uh, the digging further, uh, what I realized is there are some maritime issues that were addressed by the tribunal. I was talking to him at lunch and he said he worked primarily the land issues. Um, but I think what's more important for this project is, as, as Peter said, the procedure was important and, and, and worth highlighting in that case. Very important to highlight in this case. And before you start going, oh, sip pro, I'm going to go to sleep. Um, the procedure is like a soap opera in this particular case. Um, and so it is, to a certain level, fascinating. I don't have a chart or a map uh, showing uh, where this is, but suffice it to say, uh, it's about the northern portion of the Adriatic Sea up on the high part of the, the uh, calf of the Italian boot. Just think about that. Okay, Adriatic Sea on the back of the boot and up in the top right quadrant. Uh, what happened was when, um, when the Soviet, uh, excuse me, Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia started dissolving and uh, in 1991, both Slovenia and Croatia declared independence. And so at that point, they started needing to sort out where the land boundary was and where their maritime boundary was. And so that was the genesis for all of this. This all started in 1991 when they started, when they both declared independence the exact same day. And then for the next uh, 10 years or so, they started going into negotiations to resolve it. And that's kind of, the, if I give you essentially up front four, four takeaways from this case for what it means for resolving these disputes. Uh, that's the first one is uh, the process on these cases are long and winding roads and it can be a very circuitous process. And that's no surprise to Paul as he's been living a, a number of these cases. But uh, in this particular case, for example, once they started negotiating in 1992, 
they continued to try to negotiate and resolve it for another nine years. And it wasn't until they got to about 2001 in 2002 that they started realizing, okay, we aren't going to be able to negotiate this between us. We need to go to some sort of third party. And so they, uh, one party threw out the idea of potentially going to the ICJ. That was rejected by the other. They continued to posture. They tried to work negotiations at every level, including the prime ministers, including the foreign ministers, including the legal experts and the technical experts. They just couldn't reach an outcome. And then ultimately in 2009, after a couple of years, they were able to negotiate an arbitration agreement. And, and that's the second point that's worth noting. And that's because th with the arbitration, use of arbitration instead of uh, an established tribunal, uh, it allows parties to tailor uh, the nature and scope of this institution or this organization for this purpose. And so what happened in this case is that there were a number of substantive issues that the arbitral, uh, arbitral tribunal was, was given to look at, and it was a hybrid there were some land territory border issues as well as some maritime boundary issues as well as some use of water space issues as to how was Slovenia going to get out of the northern portion of the Adriatic when there's no high seas corridor. Okay? And so what happened in that case was that they were allowed to craft not only what were going to be the issues covered by this, these arbiters but also what was going to be the applicable uh, standards that were going to apply, that the, the, that the arbiters were going to apply. And so as a result, uh, for a couple of the disputes, it said we will, uh, the, the arbitrators will be allowed to apply international law, principles of international law. But then with, for example, the, the use issue, it said they'll be allowed to apply law um, as well as um, uh, equity, as well as uh, good neighborly relations. And so it gave them latitude, the arbiters, to look at those kind of and weigh things beyond just what does the hard and fast black letter law say or what does customary law say. Uh, so that gives uh, the value of giving latitude for the parties to decide how they want to approach this. Uh, the third key takeaway was uh, the soap opera that I was talking about. And that is some improper conduct that happened during the case. And essentially, um, once they, uh, the arbiters were uh, identified, uh, appointed, uh, they started setting the schedule through a procedural order, and then in the first two years of the litigation um, uh, was kind of standard for, for a number of these other cases, including the Philippines case. They set a deadline of when the memorials do, when the counter memorials do, when the uh, uh, supporting evidence is due, um, and all of those uh, kind of standard practices. So everything was going fine in those first two years, and then the, uh, the Slovenia foreign minister gave an interview in the press in which uh, they said that, you know, we've had some discussions with The Hague uh, on this case and also said, and we're hearing that uh, the arbiters are going to, uh, they're going to address the issue when it comes to uh, use of the water space. So uh, Croatia immediately, no surprise, said, how are you hearing these inside baseball stories? Uh, they sent a letter to Slovenia, uh, Slovenia asking for explanation and then brought it to the attention of the tribunal. And uh, so then at about that time, a newspaper in both Croatia as well as a newspaper in Serbia published transcripts of these ex parte communications between the uh, agent of Slovenia and essentially the primary lead <coughs> officer for the uh, uh, Slovenia government in the case and the Slovenian appointed arbiter on the five member panel. And these transcripts essentially did several things. It revealed that, uh, hey, what you should do is, when you're talking to the other four uh, arbitrators, you should use these arguments in your deliberations. Um, and one of the other things was, hey, um, so use these two documents and use these arguments. And in meanwhile, the Slovenian appointed uh, arbitrator was sharing information back as to what was being said by the other four during the deliberations. So once this came to light, obviously Croatia was significantly concerned. And then, uh, as many of you are familiar with U.S. constitutional law, the kind of Saturday night massacre dealing with uh, the, the firing of officials in the, in the early 70s, uh, there was essentially about a week-long massacre of arbitrators leaving uh, the case. And so the Slovenian uh, resigned from the uh, arbiter. Uh, the Slovenian agent resigned. Uh, the Slovenians appointed a, a second uh, arbiter in their place who was the president of, uh, of ICJ and 
At, th at that point, that same week, Croatia uh, announced that it was withdrawing from the arbitration. Uh, and the, at that point, the Slovenian appointed arbiter, the ICJ president, said, I'm also withdrawing because I agreed to do this because I think there was going to be a way to resolve this. Um, and now that per I'm, I'm seeing this not going to go that route. Um, so it was the dynamic where uh, it still went forward. In this, and at that point, from a substance perspective, both sides had already submitted all of their uh, you know, memorials and counter memorials. And so all of the substantive evidence to address the issues, all the hearings have been all, all of that had been taken place before the ex parte communications and before this, surface, this issue came to surface. So the arbiters were able to look at all the substance and come forth with an, arbit an award in the case. And, uh, and they addressed in a separate partial award the issue of whether uh, the, there was a material breach in the arbitration agreement which allowed Croatia to leave. The tribunal said no. They said, we've, we, we've addressed it, we've, we've rebalanced the situation, so we're moving forward. Um, and in, uh, once they issued the uh, arbitral award, which was kind of mixed, um, a lot of it was in favor of Slovenia uh, as a matter of law, but it was a mixed uh, award. At that point, Slovenia said, and we're going to follow the arbitration agreement that says within six months, both sides will implement this, uh, this um, award. Croatia, since it had already withdrawn from the arbitration, said we're not going to do that. Um, so once you hit the six month mark, which was December of last year, uh, the prime ministers of both countries met uh, in uh, Zagreb and, and uh, they essentially said the same thing. We're going to follow it. And the other one said, we're not going to follow it. Now, where do we go from there? And that's the fourth takeaway from this. And that is parties trying to find uh, creative ways to effectively implement um, in these types of situations. Because obviously the system is consent based and it can be very fragile in whether there is actual uh, justice going on. And we see Croatia pulling out of this out of a concern of whether justice can go forward. Um, but on the fourth point um, with regards to uh, creative ways to implement, what Slovenia has now done uh, earlier this year is they took that award and since both nations joined the EU in what was part of the negotiation of even having jurisdiction over the case in the arbitration was they agreed that Croatia, Slovenia was no longer going to block Croatia's attempt to join the EU. But now that they are both members of the EU, Slovenia in the past six months has uh, brought a case before the EU Court of Justice saying that Croatia is in violation of international law and in violation of EU law because it's not following that ruling. So uh, obviously in each case it can be different as to what those creative ways are for implementing uh, existing awards. Um, and in, in the uh, Asian way, there is not a common uh, governmental body such as the EU that oversees both uh, any of the claimants. You have ASEAN, but obviously a number of these disputes uh, are between China and uh, the other Southeast Asian nations who are in China not being a member of ASEAN. So it just goes to show I don't know what the answer is as to what the creative ways to implement are in some of these Asian uh, disputes, uh, but you have to think creatively because it is a consent-based system and uh, you've got to work with what you have. And so with that, I will uh, wrap up and turn it over Thank to you Henry. Much. now going to hear from Henry Ben Surto, who knows as much about the Philippine arbitration with China as anybody, and uh, I hope he's going to tell us something that will be the most recent word about the <laughs> Philippine attitude toward the enforcement of the award. Henry, we very much appreciate your making the trip from San Francisco and providing a few slides for us to absorb. One of the questions that we have, of course, with all the experience and the innovations in public international law that relate to the South China Sea problem, what can be done? What solutions seem appropriate for this particular South China Sea problem. We talk about Mischief Reef. Nothing could be more appropriately named than Mischief Reef. Uh, and 
the question is, can something be done to solve the problem? Henry, we look to you for an answer. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, good afternoon to all. I'm Henry Bensurto. Uh, I'm now the Consul General in San Francisco, and I was living there for the last two years in comfort uh, after the arbitration, but it was very difficult to say no to Jerry when I received the email from Jerry. Uh, it put me in a dilemma whether to go or not. Uh, but I thought, why not? If I can help uh, be part of the solution, why not? If I can be of help in terms of understanding the issue so that we can use the issue as a point of reference in solving the problem, not just in the South China Sea, but elsewhere, why not? And I think this advocacy of Jerry, and he's not just an academician, but he's, he's very much an advocacy of peace. And I thought it's an honor to be part of that and to contribute. And so I said, yes. The second reason was that uh, Paul is here, <laughs> obviously. And uh, I really love to you know, say thank you. Uh, and I say this not, not just me in person, but an entire nation. In fact, if I may, and I don't think this is to exaggerate, the entire global system, the current political structure that is anchored on rule of law, has so much to say thank you to Paul. And I would say that Paul is not just an expert, but he's a man of honor and integrity and ethics. And I think in this profession, that's very critical. In fact, I may say that I was part of the selection process, and that was the most critical criterion for me. And that was the thing that really I thought was very important if we're going to embark on, on the arbitration. And that's who Paul is. He's just so humble. So he will not say that, so I will say it in public. <laughs> Having said that, I come here, I will have to do the disclaimer that uh, I come here uh, uh, based on my personal opinion. And nothing is, I don't represent the government in terms of this issue. I've been detached from the issue after the arbitration. And I come here not in any way to undermine, subvert, or interpret my, the, my, my government's current policy. Uh, and, uh, 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 but at the same time, if I say the right thing, then you can attribute that to my government. But if I say the wrong, <laughs> but if I say the wrong things, it's me on, and on me alone. Uh, I'd like to make that clear. Uh, I'd like to preface my presentation by uh, several points because I thought the conversation this morning was very good. And I think they're very much part of the building block in the understanding rule of law. And I have my own takeaway, which I thought is going to be very important also as I make the presentation. One is that rule of law is not just arbitration. It's not just going to third party. Uh, it's not even just negotiation. For me, it's much deeper than that. It's a mindset. It's a virtue. It's a, it's a way of life. Uh, what that means is that there has to be a repetition of good habits. Uh, virtue is a repetition of good, good acts, and when you keep on repeating that, it becomes a habit. Uh, and this is what rule of law is about. It's norm setting. It's nor, uh, and, and, and the arbitration in South China is all about that. But when you look at it much deeper also, when you say repetition, it talks about time. Uh, so you have to give it time uh, for that habit to set in and mature uh, and come to fruition. And I think this is uh, another uh, point for discussion, but I would be very interested in, on that part of the discussion. Uh, the second point I'd like to, and I, I will take away from that, uh, is that in the case of the Philippines, I remember we, did not, we didn't like to go to arbitration also. I, I must tell you that it was a hard decision for us to go into that. In fact, uh, we've been into many negotiations, but only when we were completely resolved that we have to do it, then we have to do it. In fact, I was given the presidential authority to make the last effort, a last ditch effort, and I had a back channeling with my counterpart. I will not say the name, but I had a secret meeting and I laid out, uh, uh, let's give the discussion a chance. Because at the time, I remember in 2009, 
I, I was traveling all over Southeast Asia and China. I was in Beijing many times. And we created, generated a formula which I call Zone of Peace, Freedom, Friendship, and Cooperation, which I thought was a good formula that was a win-win uh, for all of us, a political solution at that. Uh, I will discuss that uh, in much detail, but just to give you an idea what that was. I, I, I suggested at the time in 2009, because of the submission for extended continental shelf, uh, how can we proceed with this submission if there are disputes? Maybe I, if I can, and I sought authority from the president at the time, maybe if I can uh, have uh, a political settlement by which all of us will agree to set aside our territorial disputes and somehow enclave the rocks within 12 nautical miles, then this will allow everybody to submit extended continental submissions. Uh, Vietnam was upfront on that. Malaysia was 50-50, but the most difficult was China at the time. And so uh, what came about was a series of back and forth, uh, but, and, and that's why it, this led me uh, to the conclusion that at the end of the day, power is something that's very difficult to let go. Uh, when you think you can, you know, ram yourself and you think you have that good shot, it's very tempting to do it that way. And it's very hard to be humble, I thought. Uh, I will not elaborate anymore. But uh, I think it came to the point, therefore, that I guess we have to do in the arbitration now. Uh, we have no choice. There were two decision points. Do we manage or do we resolve? We looked at the figures. Managing was a good, was a good, uh, I would say, was a good thing to do, because <laughs> uh, you manage. You don't, if you cannot resolve, you manage. But what we found out, we tried to manage the issue in 97. We thought it was done with the DOC after Mischief Reef. But then uh, uh, it did not solve. Uh, Reed Bank came into, in, 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 became an issue. And so we've come to the conclusion, management does not serve the purpose. We have to go now into resolution. Whatever we can resolve, we'll try to resolve. And so from management of disputes, we've come to the point of resolving whatever we can solve. There are two issues there, the territorial dispute and the maritime dispute. And this is, we disaggregated and analyzed the dispute and kind of classified the maritime from the territorial. Territorial will take centuries to solve. Maritime, we have a good shot. Uh, and then it came to play that uh, once we've come to the point where negotiation is not going to, to bring fruits, then we decided on arbitration. Let me go therefore to arbitration and uh, and the South China Sea. I will not bore you with technicalities because it's meant for a real classroom and it will, so I will give you hopefully a more interesting than that because it, uh, technicalities will make you sleep. Uh, but I thought it's very, it's better to show, to show the map of South China Sea because for many, I've been involved in this issue since 97 and what I have, I have observed was that we keep on going around in circles. We keep on talking of certain things, but at the end of the day, we really didn't understand what we were talking because we didn't, have, we didn't look at the map. We, didn't, we assumed the disputes as being there without going through and analyzing the reasons and cause and sources, why, what exactly is the dispute. And so I thought the map should should enable us to understand it better. My last point, sorry for this brief. The dispute between the Philippines and China and South China Sea is far-reaching. Far-reaching because it does not only involve the two countries. The implication is much more than that. And the map, as I go through it, will, will tell you. So I, I, I segmented it into three categories, South China Sea and bef before and after arbitration. Because for us to appreciate arbitration and the effects and the, what is the move forward, we have to understand the past. 
what essentially was the dispute? How, why? What, uh, uh, what, what created the situation? And second, how did we get there? The content of the arbitration that uh, Paul prepared. And finally, what is the move forward? So let me go ahead. Uh, South China Sea is like a, a bowl of spaghetti or noodles. It's crisscrossing, and, and that makes it very complicated and so complex. Why? Because uh, the, the, uh, the lines that you see there uh, is the baseline of all the countries with the law of the sea. That line that you see now is the 200 uh, exclusive economic zone. I will not explain what these are. Uh, I, I assume that, uh, you know. Uh, and then you have the nine dash line uh, that goes beyond the 200 uh, nautical miles exclusive zone of, of China. And then you have this territorial dispute anchored on those rocks that you see. And because each of these rocks, if they are rocks or islands, they will generate a maritime entitlement. And so th these are the different territorial 12 nautical miles in theory. And the different color signifies the various occupants of those rocks. And this is the theoretical 200 mile if they are generated from each rock. And, uh, uh, and so, and then if you are going to treat it as an archipelago, uh, and the archipelago generates 200 miles. And so what you have here is a crisscrossing lines. See how complicated it is. And this, the lack of clarity there, uh, essentially I've always said this, this lack of clarity fueled the tension in the South China Sea. So perhaps one way of uh, minimizing the tension is if we can somehow simplify uh, these lines, then uh, we have a good chance at peace. And if we can actually reduce it to this point, uh, which is now the case after the arbitration, we now have a good foundation of how to move forward in the future. Because arbitration is not the end all be all, it's a tool. It's just a tool, a step forward on how to uh, really achieve lasting, durable peace, not just for the Philippines, but for China and the entire South China Sea littoral states and also uh, the region, uh, essentially, because I've said East China Sea and South China Sea and Indian Ocean is part of a continuing, a continuing sea lanes of communication. And so they are so interrelated. So this is before arbitration, and this is after arbitration. That is the consequence of the arbitration. But how did we get to this uh, 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 South China Sea where you don't have those lines anymore, where the 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zones are very clear? I'll forego. So uh, Paul has a lot of things to say here in terms of the 15 submissions that Paul uh, did. One, uh, uh, submissions one and two has something to do with the 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone of, of China and the Philippines. And we also submitted that the nine dash line, the historic rights, uh, does not have foundation in uh, uh, UNCLOS. And so uh, the tribunal agreed with that, with Paul. Uh, and, uh, the nine dash, there's no historic rights on the nine dash line. Second, so, uh, third submission was on Scarborough Shoal. That Scarborough Shoal is not an island, but a rock. Uh, as a rock, it is only entitled to 12 nautical miles and is not entitled to 200 nautical miles exclusive zone, economic zone. The tribunal said it is a rock and therefore it does not have 200. Submission four and five, uh, 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 Subi Reef, Michi Reef, Second Thomas Shoal, uh, uh, it, 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 we argued that these are not uh, islands, neither are they rocks, they are low tide elevations, and therefore, as low tide elevations do not generate any maritime entitlements at all, they are subject to the proximity of which country has 200 over them. And 
and uh, the tribunal agreed. Submissions number six, Gavin and Makina, Makina and Reeves as uh, rocks. We said they're not islands as well. And, uh, and the tribunal said agreed. Submission number seven, Fiery Cross Reef, Quarter Run Reef, Johnson Reef. Uh, uh, we argued they are not islands and therefore not entitled to 200, but are entitled only to 12 nautical miles. Tribunal agreed. Uh, submissions eight and nine, uh, we, uh, uh, that we are entitled to 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone as well as 200 uh, nautical mile uh, continental shelf and that we have the exclusive sovereign rights to, to explore and exploit the resources in accordance with uh, UNCLOS and that China interfered with those rights uh, uh, and uh, the court agreed. Submission number 10 uh, is that, uh, and this is what Paul was referring to earlier, that Scarborough Shoal, I'm talking with even within the 12 nautical miles, because in theory, if uh, a, a state who has sovereignty over Iraq uh, or, or a feature, you have 12 nautical miles, which is territorial in nature. Uh, but in this case, regardless of who owns, by the way, the, 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 the tribunal has no jurisdiction, nor did they decide on who owns Scarborough. So regardless of who, who has sovereignty over that Iraq, did mention that Scarborough Shoal, uh, traditional fishing by Filipino fishermen, uh, should be allowed, and, and that's the reason why all of said we were able to go in there and fish, not just within the 12 nautical miles, but even inside the lagoon. It's a, it's a kind of a... And uh, on submission number 11, uh, that there, was, uh, there were marine environmental destruction. This has something to do with the creation of the artificial islands and, and the tribunal agreed and therefore uh, China was engaged in unlawful uh, destruction of the marine environment. Mischief Reef again was uh, part of submission 12 uh, that it is an artificial islands, uh, island that was uh, 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 but when you uh, if you go back uh, when it was undeveloped it was but a low tide elevation and uh, the the court uh, the tribunal agreed with that. So uh, let's talk about mischief reef. We're running out of time. Right, uh, okay. And the question before the house is, what can be done? Let's just clarify mischief reef. As I understand it, it's a reef. At high tide, it is not above water. Therefore, it is not susceptible of being claimed as the territory of any state. Nevertheless, China developed it into an artificial island and has turned that into a base of some kind. Is it a military base? It is. It is. And it lies within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Yes. So this is what the United States and other Western powers and maybe some Asian are up against. You have China taking a reef, turning it into an artificial island that becomes a military base in the exclusive economic zone of another country. And now we say that's illegal. Yes. What can be done about it? Now we hear a range of international law possibilities of settling other disputes. And one could think of many possible solutions. One is, Chinese could say, we'll respect the decision of the arbitration and we'll leave. We'll dismantle the military base, etc. That doesn't appear to be on the cards at this point. China could say, well, we'll convert the military base into entirely peaceful uses, taking care of ships that run afoul of bad weather in the neighborhood, or we'll work on the environment, or we'll save the fish, or something. Or China could say, we welcome other countries to join us. 
and we'll internationalize this. Uh, China could say any number of things. International law seems to be very imaginative if the parties are looking for a solution. What could be done here that might settle at least that problem? I gather from what was said earlier, the other six bases that China has recently constructed are not susceptible of the same legal challenge at this point. But the problem is, can we do anything? Vice President Pence keeps making these statements on behalf of the United States. We will not accept what China is doing. But realistically, what can be done? Uh, I have an answer to that. Good. Uh, um, I don't think anyone else has. <laughs> well, when I say answer, it may not be the right one. <laughs> but uh, let me put it this way. The arbitration somehow narrowed the issues. That's a good point. So it narrowed on the mischief read. So in effect, it has, it has solved uh, a significant percentage of the problem, and so we're limited now to specific issues. Going down to the mischief read and the other racks uh, where you have activities happening, I will connect that this to my earlier thesis about rule of law as being norm creation habit forming matter of time. Certain things cannot be forced overnight. We have to be patient, but we have to be committed. We have to be consistent. It's the same way when you rear your child, you bring him up, you teach him virtues. It, he doesn't get the, the, the lesson on one day. Sometimes it takes years, but you keep on repeating as a parent. And someday, hopefully, when he's of a right mind, that will come back, and that creates the right environment now for a, for a solution. You don't, you reverse the process, you don't exercise your parental authority or your parental obligation, that child is going to grow up a spoiled brat. And time will come when he's now very big, you cannot teach him anything anymore because he's stronger than you. So. We have to find the right teachable moments to be able to inject that right mindset and keep on repeating it consistently, constantly, as they say, ram it down, uh, but peacefully. <laughs> and, uh, peacefully all the time. And arbitration is a peaceful way, by the way. Never is it a, a kind of aggression. It is still a peaceful way. Uh, I will not go to the specifics of how to create that habit, uh, but there has, it, it is peaceful but forceful. Uh, because sometimes you have to show resolve to your kid. Now, recently, I'm, not, I'm not saying China is a kid, by no means am I saying that, but all of us, in a way, when we are learning some virtue, we are, we operate in, a, in a, the, the same manner because Habit is not necessarily automatic, it's acquired. Uh, it's not something that's automatically God-given there. So we have to do our part. And that's why when I'm asked, is the arbitration, can it be not enforced? Pardon me, I, will, I have a different perspective on that. My take is that it is enforceable, but the manner by which an international law is enforced is different from the manner by which it is enforced in, the, in a domestic setting. Because the tools that are available to you in a domestic setting is different from the tools available to you in the international setting. And you have to be able to use a mix of tools to be able to enforce that always peaceful. Uh, so and so, where, where now does... to the specifics. Uh, uh, let me jump, therefore, and go to the specifics uh, in terms of solving, because this is my solution. And I will always, I will go back to my perspective of Sophic. Because for me, this is the solution. And this has something to do with Deng Xiaoping's perspective of setting aside uh, their, uh, disputes. And what the arbitration has done is set aside the sovereignty issue. We enclave it, and those areas that within the, uh, I don't, do I have a, um, the, 
Then it, it allows us now to engage in cooperation under part nine uh, of, uh, 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 of, of UNCLOS because fish tak in the South China Sea is not territorial. They straddle uh, and, and therefore efforts to conserve, for example, uh, has to be a regional effort. But the difference between now and then, in the past, the, the regulation of fishing has become a tool to exercise sovereignty. Now, with this clarification, that cooperation in terms of regulating overfishing now has not, no sovereignty implications because 9 9 has been clarified, the characters of the features have been clarified, and therefore transnational or intrastate cooperation is now much part, part of international cooperation sanctioned under UNCLOS. And at the same time, we now have to engage in maritime delimitation because the clarification made by, by the tribunal now allow us, all the littoral states, to engage in bilateral maritime delimitation. For example, in the south, we can now have a maritime delimitation with Indonesia and Malaysia. In the north, in the eastern, eastern seaboard, this will now allow us to have a maritime delimitation with Palau. In the north, we, this will now allow us to have maritime delimitation with Taiwan and also with China. But, but China, because we're one China policy. Sorry, my friend from, but uh, uh, so, so uh, we can have that delimitation uh, already in our northern uh, border with China, uh, essentially. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, this clarification of overlapping is now doable. In the past, they were not doable because of that lack of clarity. And finally, uh, by enclaving the territorial disputes, we can let this go on for as long as we're able to enclave it. And that gives us opportunity now to be clear in terms of how to do the code of conduct. Because here, the code of conduct now will have something to do with mischief reef. For example, how do we conduct our behavior uh, in terms so that we don't generate without giving that particular uh, feature uh, 12 nautical miles, maybe there are certain safety zones, for example, 500 meters, uh, something like that. I'm just giving some examples so that you avoid also friction, unnecessary encounters. When your ships are there and you are able to exercise freedom of navigation, uh, you have to create a habit. There should be no interdiction. There should be no granting of consent. There should be no asking of consent on EEZ, something like that. And, and that code of conduct, therefore, now becomes specific, and it creates the possibility for that code of conduct to be a real, legally binding, doable, specific acts or behavior. Finally, those enclave areas can now be areas for joint marine cooperation or protective areas, marine protected areas, because to, uh, the point of the matter is that these features are actually marine sanctuaries. This is where tuna is able to replenish its stocks, and if we destroy the corals there, we endanger the, the coastal states in, the, in terms of their marine consumption. And the Philippines, for one, is about 80%, we 80 of our population. We're a quintessential coastal town. Uh, more than 75% of our towns is less than 100 uh, kilometers away uh, or miles away from, from the coast. And therefore, a large population of the archipelago, and, and so is with the other littoral states, are dependent on, on the marine production, on the marine resources. And this joint cooperation among ourselves now, including the conception of marine protected areas on those enclave areas, will now allow opportunities, rather than opportunities of dispute, they now become opportunities for joint cooperation. With that, I will, I will, uh, I will end with, uh, uh, with the saying, frontiers are the razor's edge on which 
uh, hung, suspended the issues of war and peace. The sooner we're able to clarify all of those overlaps, the better for us. Thank you. I'm delighted to hear this vigorous, positive <laughs> evaluation of the much maligned Philippine Arbitration Award. Uh, and not from an armchair academic like me, but somebody who is an experienced, knowledgeable diplomat. In October 2012, I published an article in the South China Post calling for the use of arbitration of disputes in order to narrow the issues, not to solve them. Negotiation is always essential. But I said arbitration can often be useful. And a few retired American diplomats criticized me by saying, you don't understand. Arbitration is just going to make things worse. It's the last thing we want. Don't interfere with our negotiations after 20 years of unsuccessful negotiations. <laughs> Then you surprised us three months later by bringing this secret until you made the claim arbitration. And I was tremendously excited because I thought, this is, these are real diplomats. And now you tell us, despite everything that's happened since the award has come down, that there are some good aspects to this. And it's going to be easier, perhaps, eventually to solve some of these questions. Now, I liked also your emphasis on a peaceful solution. But what are we Americans to think? Every other day, there's an item in the press about the US going on one of these freedom of navigation things. We're sending a destroyer nearby this island or that. And then occasionally, we have a close shave with the Chinese that we might have some other incident. What's the utility of the American military gestures? That seems to be. The only thing we feel we can do, uh, other than just empty talk, challenging mischief reef and what China has done. Should we use military maneuvers uh, so that we can go within 12 miles of this reef? And China says, you're entering our territorial sea. And we say, you have no territorial sea because you have no territory on mischief reef. What's the use? And here we have two experienced naval officers. <laughs> How do you defend the US use of military maneuvers? Can't we just make a statement from the Pentagon? Or why don't we clarify it? The American public hasn't got any understanding of the implications of these military maneuvers. Uh, either way. Yes. Uh, so this is where I include that disclaimer that I should have included in my remarks yeah. that these are the views of me personally and not of any agency of the Department of Defense or the U.S. government. Um, I think what's important is there to understand is that there are uh, limited, a limited role for freedom of navigation operations. And Peter and I have often talked about that FON operations is not a strategy. I mean, I'm the first one to say that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's a certain there are several different types of uh, territorial maritime disputes existing in the South China Sea at the same time. And so U.S. policy has longstanding been we don't take sides on competing claims. And so that was, you heard that a lot in the arbitration case where if the U.S. gave a public statement, it was saying something to that effect. We're not siding with the Philippines, we're not siding with China. This is something for them to sort out as to who has sovereignty of these features, which was not subject to the, the arbitration. but. Um, but where the U.S. did have an interest is maintaining freedom in the area and in accordance with what international law says. And so when it came to excessive maritime claims, that's where the freedom of navigation operation. So it's essentially two U.S. policies coexisting to address two different types of disputes that are in the South China Sea. So that's where the freedom of navigation operations come into play. If any coastal state uh, enacts a or seeks to enact a maritime claim that's in excess of what international allows, then the U.S. is going to diplomatically protest it, which we do, but they're also going to operationally challenge it because that's really the, the two key ways under international law for state action to manifest itself. Paul? Well, I, I don't disagree with anything uh, Jonathan has said. In fact, I, I, I take that all as a given, but I think it shows the, um, the myopic uh, 
uh, approach, uh, and indeed self-defeating approach, that the United States has, has taken. Um, as Jonathan has said, there are a number of different disputes. Freedom of navigation uh, deals with uh, uh, the, the ability of, of U.S. ships to navigate in these waters. But it doesn't address the issue of uh, rule of law, enforcement of uh, the rule of law, and respect for the rule of law, in particular respect for an arbitral award that is uh, under uh, international law uh, legally binding and obligatory to comply with. Uh, one would have hoped, maybe I'm just too idealistic, but one would have hoped that the United States would stand for the rule of law, for strengthening the rule of law, for strengthening a rules-based international order. From time to time in our history, in our best moments, we have done exactly that. And aren't we doing that when we send a ship, a military vessel, within 12 miles of Mischief Reef? We, aren't we recognizing the international law laid down by the Arbitration Tribunal? In a very, very, only in a very, very narrow and, as I said before, self-defeating sense. What, what, is, uh, it, what the United States, in my opinion, nobody, they didn't ask me, but, uh, <laughs> what, what the United States should be doing is not taking a position that, well, we have no interest in this. Yes, during the course of the arbitration, it was appropriate for the United States, which the Obama administration did, to say, we support the arbitral process, we support the uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, we support adjudication uh, as a, to obtain a final resolution here. But we don't have an interest in whether the Philippines or China wins. That changes, or at least it should have changed, once a unanimous arbitral award by five of the world's most respected international jurists was issued. At that point, it became uh, a legally binding obligation not only under the Law of the Sea Convention, which the United States is not a party, but under general international law. And the United States is certainly a, a part of that. And I think where, where the, the emphasis has been exactly where Jonathan has described it, and I think that's where U.S. policy is wrong. U.S. policy should be, rather than antagonizing China, rather than provoking it, uh, uh, through an exclusive reliance on freedom of navigation uh, uh, exercises, which creates the threat of a use of force. The United States ought to be using all of its influence, which has diminished considerably in the last two years, um, but the United States should also be using the force of all of its allies, which again have diminished considerably over the last two years, to uh, mount an international effort. Indeed, there are many countries in the region and throughout. Um, we've mentioned Vietnam, Indonesia, we could mention Malaysia, Singapore, others, India, Australia, the EU, that would have been very happy to support and join the United States in an effort to promote the rule of law and peaceful resolution of disputes and compliance with international obligations, including those emanating from uh, international arbitral awards in the South China Sea. I neglected to mention Japan and South Korea, which undoubtedly would be part of, of this effort. Yet the United States has abandoned its leadership role. It's abandoned the area. It's abandoned its respect for the rule of law and for the peaceful resolution of disputes. This is an aberrant behavior uh, that uh, is not only contrary to the interests of peaceful settlement of disputes, the interests of the parties to the dispute in the South China Sea, it's contrary to U.S. national interests in the short and in the long run. This is what makes being an international lawyer or a believer in the rule of law these days so, so challenging. But none of us in this room is going to give up. We're not going to give up the fight. We're going to continue our support our belief in a rules-based international order. And like my former, my mentor, my late mentor, Abe Chase, friend of, old friend of Jerry Cohn used to say, we have to 
hold America to its own best standards. And we can't give up that effort. I want Peter Dutton to make the final comment <laughs> before we have a 10 minute break and then we'll renew this discussion in the context of the East China Sea, yeah, which just, isn't simple either. I, I, I regret, I actually disagree with a lot of what you just said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because we could do a whole separate panel on this. But um, sure. uh, yeah, that, that's right, we should. One of the problems that the United States has is, is Regrettably, we are not a signatory. We are a signatory. We're not a ra we have not right. ratified UNCLOS. And, and so part of the reason for it, it's so particularly important that we do the freedom of navigation operations is that we only enjoy uh, freedom of navigation as a matter of customary international law. And in customary international law, if you don't exercise your rights, you lose them. It's considered to be acquiescence. So that's number one. You so have to do it by a ship's. You do. Can yes, you do no, it no. by a statement. You have to act inconsistent with the claim. Act, not just a statement. A statement is not sufficient over time to preserve your uh, your rights. Second, um, I think we have a much different policy over the last year, at least, than we've had in in, in, in a significant period of time. The the policy of the U.S. government has changed significantly. I think, Jerry, uh, there's, there's been a tremendously different approach to the power dynamics in the region because the fundamental problem is the rest of us have been operating in terms of legal dynamics and China has been operating in terms of power dynamics. It's a mismatch of policies. And so in order to make the legal dynamic effective, there has to be an effective power dynamic to support it. That's essentially what, what, what Henry was saying earlier. Um, and the, the bottom line is there has been a much different power dynamic in the South China Sea in the last year. Third, um, I, I disagree. I think the U.S. actually, the statements, uh, Secretary Mattis at Shangri-La in particular, I think was quite eloquent in support of rules-based order in the South China Sea, and that's exactly what he is referring to. I can't recall specifically whether he said he referred to the, the, the arbitration specifically, but he was clearly in uh, referencing a rules-based order in the South China Sea in terms of American policy for the region. And, and fourth, um, in terms of the international effort to support the outcome of the award, I think what we've seen is a tremendous um, opera operationalization of the international effort to to enforce the awards, if not necessarily always referring to the award itself, but the outcome of the rights in the South China Sea. Um, so, so I actually think that there has been movement in this regard. I don't think we're going to see a change in the South China Sea until power and law operate together in an effective way. Well, I'm in favor of greater clarification <clears throat> because so many gestures are taking place, so many acts and the American people are only vaguely aware of the implications. What are the legal bases for doing this? What are the possible consequences? And how can we do better? But I think this discussion has amply ventilated <laughs> some of these issues. And I want to thank the speakers very much. And I look forward to the next round this afternoon in 10 minutes. All right, 10 minutes it is.